You ever see this symbol on math, right? Where you have a number that's in between two lines? They call that the absolute value. And what that tells you is exactly how many steps a number, whether it be positive or negative, is away from zero. It's the absolute value, right? You know exactly how old that, or how far away that number is. It's a really important thing, right? In math, you might see it all the time. Well, for Earth and for geology, how do we find out an exact date, an absolute date? How can we tell how far away a rock layer is from the beginning? In relative dating, we put things in order, but that doesn't give us an exact and absolute date. Well, today in this video, we're going to see how scientists and how geologists and paleontologists are actually able to get an absolute date for rock layers. All right, so there's going to be in this video, we're going to be looking at two different things. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to examine something called absolute dating. And sometimes you might read it in a book called radiometric dating, but in this video, we're going to call it absolute dating. We're also going to look how scientists and paleontologists and geologists, the whole group of them, use absolute dating and use different pieces and information to figure out exactly the age of a fossil or a rock so that we don't have to just rely on relative dating to give us an and-then story, but we know exactly when something happened. All right, so we're going to be doing those two things. Make sure you're writing that in your Cornell note sheet in that big ideas section. All right, well, let's kind of go back here. We talked about relative dating in some other videos, and relative dating is really creating that and-then story. Remember, we talked a little bit about how kids tell stories and how we can use the laws of geology to come up with and-thens. So, first this layer was formed, and the fossils in it happened, and then the next layer, and then the next layer, and then the next layer. Right? Well, that's helpful to us. We can put things in order, but it's definitely not getting us the exact date. We need to know exactly when something happened. Now, we can use some clues that we might know. Maybe uh, we know uh, when a volcano erupts, like the exact date. And if we see a layer of ash, we can tie that in. But that only goes back so far. How do we go back to the beginning of Earth? How do we find out exactly when that happened? How do we know that our and-then story, that this layer is a million years old and not a thousand years old or a year old or an hour old. How can we figure out exactly the date? Right? We need to know this so we can use geology and we can use uh, different things around the earth and we can tell the story of our earth. Well, it really comes back to this thing called absolute dating. And to explain absolute dating with you, I'm going to actually do an experiment in our minds. All right? These are some of my favorite ones because they're low cost and you can do it right here at home as you're watching this video. I want you to imagine you have a coin, right? Maybe it's a quarter, penny, dime, nickel, one of those Canadian coins, whatever. And you flip it. What's the odds that it's going to come up heads? It's 50%, right? What's the odds it's going to come up tails? It's also 50%, right? There's an equal chance of getting heads or tails. All right, so we can understand that. So let's pretend for here for a second I have a million coins. Here they are. They're all stacked up right here a million coins, right? And I am going to flip all million of them at the same time into the air, right? There's coins flying everywhere. And when they get on the ground, any coin that comes up heads, I'm going to take it and I'm going to take it out of my game. How many coins should I have left after the first flip? Well, it should be about 500,000, right? If it's a 50-50 chance that it could be heads or tails, that means half of them should be heads and half should be tails. So, after our first flip, we should have 500,000 coins, give or take. Okay, so now I'm going to take those again, all 500,000. I'm going to flip them in the air, flip them, and they all fall to the ground. And again, I go around and I take all the heads and I throw them away or I put them out of the game. How many coins should I have left then? should be about 250,000, right? And if we keep doing this, that number should be decreased in half. Right? The next flip should have 125,000. If I go down to my fifth flip, right, I should have around 31,000. And then like on the seventh flip, I should only have about 7,000 or almost 8,000 coins left. Right? That's almost under 1% of my coins left and after only seven flips. Right? But that value, that information we found out, and 
you record in a data sheet just like every experiment we do, you can use. Let's pretend for a second I didn't see you guys flip the coins. And I came in at some random part in the class and I saw how many coins you had left. I could figure out how many times you flipped it. Let's say, for instance, you had 238 coins left. Or, I'm sorry, 238,000 coins left. Well, it's probably a pretty safe bet that you're on your second flip. I'm sorry, your third flip. Right? You flipped it twice before. Why? Because that's how the proportions work. If I come another time and I notice that you have, I don't know, 32,000 coins left, it's probably a pretty good idea that you're on your fifth flip. I, mean, I can use the number of coins to figure out how many times you flipped it. In fact, if we wanted to, we could say the half-life, the amount of time it takes for half of our coins to exist, is about one flip. Now, I could change the game, we could do it with dice, and we could do all sorts of different things, the activity, and you would end up getting different half-lives, different amount of times it would take for half of your object to be there. That's really important because that's exactly how scientists and paleontologists are able to figure out an exact age of something. Now, when you find a rock layer, obviously there's no coins that you're flipping, but there is something that randomly breaks down. And that's something called a radioactive atom. Now, radioactive, I know you see in the news, it sounds scary, and you're like, oh, something's radioactive. Well, really, all radioactive means is it breaks apart and breaks into new things. That's what makes it dangerous. Some of those new things get in your body and they change you and turn you into superheroes. But what's radioactive means it's breaking down into little pieces. So, a radioactive atom randomly breaks down. They randomly fall apart and turn into new things. They do that but in a predictable way. We know what is the chance that half of a material will break down in a certain amount of time. We call that the half-life of a certain atom. Radioactive atoms all have different half-lives. So something like carbon-14 has a half-life of 500, I'm sorry, 5,700 years. That means after 5,700 years, half of the carbon-14 you have has changed, it's decayed, it's turned into something new, right? So if you started with a million pieces of carbon-14, after 5,700 years, you're only going to have 500,000 left. And after another 5,700 years, you're only going to have about 250,000 left. And so forth all the way down, just like we did with coins, right? There's all sorts of different uh, half-lives that you'll see. For instance, a radioactive atom called calcium-41. You drink that in your mouth, it's not a big deal, right? It doesn't change your body, but it's in you right now. It has a half-life of 130,000 years. That means every 130,000 years, half of your calcium disappears. Or calcium-41, other calciums are stable. Or potassium-40, might happen in a banana. It has a half-life of 1.3 billion years. Meaning every 1.3 billion years, half of your potassium is gone. Same, but not always are they extremely long. Sometimes you might find them really short. Something like nitrogen-17 only has a half-life of seven seconds. Really quick and decays very fast. In fact, there's even smaller ones than that. Some of the higher elements, when you look on a periodic table, last for milliseconds or nanoseconds. Very quickly, they break down. But that's really important because, as we saw with the coins, if you know how much carbon-14 or nitrogen or potassium um, that you started with, and you know the half-life, and you can measure how much is at the end, so you get that three pieces of information, you could figure out an exact age for something. Right? You could figure out how many half-lives away you are from when it started. And you get a really nice graph, it has a really nice curve, well, there it is right there, and you can see exactly how old this something is. We call that absolute dating, right? Or radiometric dating, which is off of radioactive material. But I like to call it absolute dating because you're getting an absolute age. So let's take a look at this. In this video, we talked about absolute dating. Right? Absolute dating is using half-lives and the probability of something breaking down to figure out an exact age of a rock layer or of a fossil or anything like that. 
and we saw how scientists use things of half-lives and radioactive material to figure out how old layers of rock are and give absolute dates to different things. So, remind you how these videos work. You can always hit pause if I'm going too fast. You can always go back and watch it again, or pause, uh, rewind it and see a part over. But always remember to keep moving forward.